Hey everybody, um, we're just going to do more paint than anything we were doing last night. Uh, this time we're going to attack that face. Uh, as you can see, I've got you know, most of it done, or at least covered, I should say. It's, uh, it's not really done yet, there's still a lot, a lot of little details, but little details do not make for good video. It's a lot of just me noodling and, you know, it matters for the original art piece, but doesn't really matter for video. Um, just to review, uh, this is our reference. It's pretty much just a straight up copy. Um, there's a little bit more detail in there if I shine a light on it. Uh, I took it out in Photoshop, but I, I left a little rim so that I could, I could see the effects of the rim lighting. Uh, so I wanted a dark line around him. Uh, this will have some kind of background, but it'll mostly just be abstract color. Uh, this is what I'll be using. It's on Strathmore 500 Series Illustration Board, printed on my printer, uh, Epson P400. It has to be put through the front of the printer because it's pretty thick. Um, but the nice thing about doing it on an illustration board is you don't have to tape it down. Uh, it's just put it, you know, attached by a magnet onto my metal board, which is covered in craft paper. I'll be using Holbein uh, gouache mostly, a little bit of M. Graham because they make a nice Payne's Gray, and uh, three different kinds of brushes from Silver Brush, the Golden Natural, Renaissance, and Black Velvet. And uh, then this is my palette over here. It's my own version of a Stay Wet palette. It is a piece of plexiglass. Uh, that's just to like lift it up a paper towel and then parchment on top of that and uh, this is how I usually arrange things um, I, I've roughly laid it out and um, started to make some things but I won't really know what I need until I really get into it uh, this is burnt sienna that's burnt umber uh, sepia is up there alizarin crimson flame red Bright orange, yellow ochre, yellow orange, uh, sepia again, Payne's gray, and this is navy. And then down here is white. I usually put a little extra bit of uh, post poster board right there to absorb some of the excess water because I, I like the, the white to stay pretty stiff. Um, just to start things out, I usually mix my warm grays and my cool grays, and then these are... Uh, tube grays, you know, perfectly mixed already. I don't have to worry about it. It kind of gives me something to base everything else off of. Uh, there, there is one lighter gray, but I, I very rarely use it. It's mostly gray number two and gray number three. Again, that's all from Holbein. Got my own brush washer. Um, I have this little doohickey, which helps you squeeze out the water. I know I've shown this before, but just in case no one's ever seen. So, you just that it squeezes out all the excess water. It's just a piece of wire that's bent into a little uh, deep V. And uh, I guess let's get started. I'm going to put this up on my tripod, so pardon the shake. I'm also going to plug it in so I don't run out of juice halfway through. And then we'll get started. Also having a nice whiskey sour. I don't always do whiskey sour, but um, we got some like good Lacroix, like tangerine essence something. So I figured I'd go ahead and use it. It tastes even better because I mixed it in a baby bottle. And I found that's the best way to do mixed drinks on the weekends when the world is stuck at home. Uh, all right, so. First thing I'm going to do is just make sure that, um, well, that it looks all right. So I'm going to get even closer. I'm going to fold this reference. Because I really want it to be right up next to it so I can really compare the two. And these are all just neodymium magnets. I can move things around as I need. Move this a little closer so you can 
Let's see. And, uh, maybe move this up a bit. Got to find a comfortable working here. And okay. Let's start out with my black velvet, which is a good watercolor brush. I'm just going to use straight up sepia, maybe some burnt umber. I just want to get all the values right. So things are getting pretty dark in here. Apologies, this is going to be kind of a boring video for the first like 20 minutes. Uh, or you could look at it another way and say that it's relaxing. I don't know how much color we're going to get into. Um, I think at some point I'll just get bored and I'll jump ahead and start slapping some color on there. But I really do need to make sure that everything is in the right place. I mean, you know, the, the drawing looks accurate enough. Uh, I basically just traced it in Photoshop. So uh, if there are any issues, take them up with Mr. Evans. It's his face. deciding how closely I want to fit it to the photo, uh, especially with things like hair. You know, you can take a lot of liberties with hair to make a painting more interesting, and uh, it won't really affect the likeness at all. So this is the one part where you can kind of experiment a little bit, not think too hard about what you're doing. Uh, when it gets into the eyes and nose, you know, facial features, it kind of, kind of tight. You know, there's not a lot of leeway for you know, that's that's really why portraits are so difficult why so many people struggle with them because your average person as long as they don't have uh, facial blindness prosopagnosia you you know you're really good at recognizing faces and so everyone almost almost everyone has that skill and because of that we can all tell when an artist fails at doing a, a good likeness. Now, you know, of course, uh, not everyone has the same level of facial recognition. It, it does actually, at least in, in my experience, there's a lot of, quite a range. Um, mine seems to be pretty good. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very rarely, uh, I very rarely misidentify people, whereas... <laughs> Uh, I do have certain friends who will remain anonymous who are very bad. Um, you know, they can, they'll, they'll be thrown off by, you know, a, a new hairstyle or a hat or glasses, like that, that kind of stuff. Uh, and it's often pretty hilarious. But that being said, uh, you can get better at it. Uh, so the example that I, I like to use is uh, when I was a kid, you know, my, my mom is the oldest of 11, so she's the first. She's got 10 younger siblings, and I could never, they all looked so wildly different to me when I was a kid. Like... Uh, some were blonde, some had red hair, some had black hair, some had facial hair. Uh, <laughs> they just, you know, they looked, I, I couldn't even imagine that they were all brothers and sisters. Uh, and, you know, it's fairly even split. It's uh, five sisters and six brothers. And, uh, you know, now, now that I'm older um, and, you know, been training myself at this for years and years. Uh, I mean, it's it's pretty obvious that, that they are. Uh, so you know, just the point I'm trying to make is that you can get better. Uh, most kids are not that good at it, but they do get better as they get older, just from you know simple experience, just looking at all the 
many faces that you come in contact throughout your entire life. Uh, but then, you know, there are, of course, people who have a, a natural ability for it. Um, you know, I never had a, a problem with it. I don't, I don't know how, uh, I don't know if there's like a way to rank that. Um, I did take uh, a test at one point. This is like, I want to say mid to late 2000s, you know, some like internet test. And um, it was like specifically made to try and, and fake people out. Um, I, don't, I don't remember like what parameters they changed, but I did get every single one right except for someone who I didn't, I didn't know, like I didn't recognize. These are all, these are all celebrities. There was a celebrity I just I had no idea. And uh, like if, I don't remember who it was now, but if I said it, you'd be like, how could you not know who that is? And it's just because it, it was an older celebrity. And I just, I knew the name, but I had no idea what they looked like. And I still, like, there's lots of uh, celebrities like that. Like, I'll hear a name in the news or a song or, or whatever, but I don't watch ton of TV. Like I watch, I watch shows, but I, I don't like watch, um, I don't watch news or, or anything like that. I mostly listen to that. So there is a, like, there was a, a point in the mid 2000s where like, I was an NPR junkie and just listening to all this stuff and I had no idea what any of these politicians looked like. Um, the best example would be um, like 2007, I was working on Mythos Fantastic Four and uh, I drew Reed Richards and, and Sue Storm and uh, my, my parents plus a lot of other people were like, oh, did you use Mitt Romney and his wife <laughs> as, as models? And I was like, uh, no, I, I knew who they were. I, you know, had, heard about them in the news, but I had absolutely no idea what they looked like. And when I saw them, I was like, I can see why you said that. Uh, they pretty much look exactly like the, the paintings I had done. Um, so that reminds me of one other time I had to draw, or I had to paint Reed Richards. Uh, it was for a 1960s style cover, and uh, my editor, Tom Brevoort, he, uh, he emailed me, asked specifically if I had used, uh, I'm going to botch the name, David Borians, uh, something like that, um, as, as a model. And I, I didn't know his name. I think I had seen his face before, but I, I definitely didn't use him as a model. But uh, that just that happens a lot because, you know, most... Most superheroes are attractive, and uh, most celebrities are attractive, and uh, the tolerances in, in change for you know what is considered attractive, you know, on, on a large scale, like worldwide, uh, it it actually doesn't vary um, that much, just in terms of proportions and, and whatnot. Like obviously, you know, there can be a lot of difference, but if you really are just talking about proportions, you know, distances. From eyes to nose to mouth, like that's that's the core of it, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Ears, eh, you know, the face. Um, there's really just not that the, the window for being attractive is just not that big, and so anytime like I'll do any kind of uh, character at all, and I'll post it to Instagram, you know, there's always always people who say, oh, that looks just like so-and-so, and, you know, they're not wrong, um, but it's, you know, a different person will look at the same thing and think of a different celebrity, and, you know, it, it doesn't have a lot to do with my drawing, it just has more to do with, uh, anyway, as we stare into the eyes of Chris Evans. I've had to paint him quite a number of times now. Uh, first time was in 20, 
was actually 2010. Uh, so the, the way that I got that first job, which was um, a casting crew poster for the Captain America movie, the first one, in uh, 2010, I knew the movie was coming out. And so it's the first time I did something on spec. Um, I wanted to do an, an illustrated poster. And I knew that the only way that it might happen is if I went ahead and did it myself. And so I made one. It, it wasn't like a full-on poster. It was just a, kind of like a pinup shot of uh, Chris Evans as Captain America. And the, I, I showed it to uh, Joe Quesada, and then he forwarded it to, I think, Kevin Feige. And... Um, or, you know, one of the producers, somebody, and uh, they said, well, we, we can't have you on the, the main thing, uh, you know, for the, the main poster, but we're doing a, uh, we'd like to do a cast and crew gift, and perfect for that. And so that's, that's how I got that first gig. Um, it was just, you know, it was something I was specifically pursuing, which is uh, not often how, how I've gotten most of my jobs. Uh, I mean, obviously, I, I try to get work at Marvel, but as far as like the specific gigs, uh, they were usually found, you know, provided to me from an editor, uh, and that's how I, I usually got my, my gigs. So uh, you know, like I said, that was that was back in 2010 when I made that that first painting, uh, and the painting did end up going. Um, it was used as a comic book cover, you know, one of like the movie tie-ins. And um, it just led to, you know, Cap, Cap 1 and then Cap 2, Winter Soldier, and then they called me back for Civil War. And uh, and then I got the last, oh, and then we did Iron Man 3. And that was, that was a fun one because it was like totally uh, different kind of style, you know, like a book cover. I lost my, lost my eraser, sorry about that. And then they called me for um, uh, the Avengers. I wish I'd gotten to do one for like the first Avengers and Age of Ultron, but um, you know, I, I could still, if I really wanted to, I could I could make one for you know, one of the various poster companies. You know, you do so many of those now. Actually, just I messed up there, uh, but it's pretty easy when it's still wet. You just kind of put some water on it, it's in the way. Uh, now, this whole time I've been using sepia. Um, I do try and pay attention to what the color is. So, in the case of the ears, there's going to be some backlighting, and you've got a little bit of the light coming through the ear. So, you want to make that a little redder or a little oranger. So, I'm going to use some flame red some uh, burnt sienna you know at, at this point it doesn't have to be perfect i just need to remind myself that that's going to be orange it's easier to do this now than to try and get that same orange uh in, in, in an opaque way you know this is all still transparent and uh, saturated color is much easier to achieve in a transparent way. Uh, just you know, think of it like stained glass. Um, that's it's always going to be much more vibrant, much more saturated because it's it's just pure, pure light. Um, you know, what it's doing is it's the light is going, it's hitting the white background and, and passing you know through the watercolor, and then coming back through it again. I, you know, again. Not a physicist, but essentially, uh, you know, that transparent color is going to be more saturated than you would ever get from putting, you know, mixing orange and putting it on opaquely and then letting it dry. For one reason, it is, uh, if it's gouache, it's going to dry matte. So it just reflects light in a totally different way. Um, you know, you don't quite have that problem with oil, uh, oil paint and acrylic, you know, it out, uh, acrylic and oil. But for gouache, you know, 
actually I like the matte finish on it and it just makes it way way easier to to scan at the end uh, so here this one it's not so much light coming through I just just want to get a feel for how, how much warmer that ear is you know I could do that on the whole face but I still want to get the, the shadows locked down before I get too in, into that um, Let me uh, so let me take a break. I'll take a sip and see if there are any questions. Thanks for watching, guys. By the way, <laughs> so dreamy. Thanks, Rich. <laughs> and Chris Evans is okay too. I guess that's that's nice. I'll keep that. Uh, yeah, the guy from Angel and Buffy, that guy, uh, Boreanzis, Boreans, I don't know. Um, <laughs> ah, time for a sip. One of you is already emailing me saying they want an Age of Ultron poster. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I'd be up for it, but there's still other things I want to do before then. I, I actually, like, I have a, a personal list of, like, stuff that I want to finish. Uh, and, and I mean, personally, I mean, uh, you know, intellectual property, you know, I'm talking an alien poster. I want to do a RoboCop poster, a Terminator poster, a Star, you know, down the list. And a lot of those I've I've actually submitted sketches for, um, you know, and they didn't go through for one reason or one reason or another. It's not like they got shot down. It's just, uh, you know, there's all different reasons that things don't get made. Uh, sometimes it's me. Sometimes it's them. Um, I've just been really kind of unproductive these last few years. But that's okay. I'm hoping I'll make more time in the future. Oh yeah, and uh, uh, Daredevil, like season seasons one through three. I'd love to do that. Which uh, I know at least one watching is uh, anxious to see as well. All right, so this part right here, it gets really dark under his chin. I don't actually want to go that dark. So that's that's always like those are the kinds of choices you need to make when you're you know, painting from photo reference. You know, I want to differentiate his skin color from the costume, the uniform. And so, you know, I want, even though the neck is in deep shadow, uh, I, I, I want it to still be separate from the uniform. And so I won't go to, you know, this is almost pure black for my printer. And uh, it just, it leads to a kind of a weird shape on the, on the face. You know what? I think I'm gonna. I'm, I really want to get that sense of light, like the rim lighting. So I'm gonna go ahead and do a light wash on the background, just so that I'm not painting against pure white. You know, the white of the of the paper. So I'll get my Renaissance flat uh, number ten, and um, maybe I'll put a little bit of something. So you can see what I'm doing. Is that showing up? Just barely. This way I just I know what I've made wet. The color is actually not that important. It's so light. I just want to see uh, you know what 
Now I haven't given much thought yet to what I want to, what color I want the background to be. Uh, so I don't want to do anything too drastic, too dramatic. You know, the reference that I'm using kind of like a, a teal background, which I'm I'm contemplating. Uh, if anything, you know, I might do kind of teal, you know, just a, a hint of yellow ochre towards the bottom, and then gets darker and darker uh, toward the top. But I, I don't, I just don't feel confident enough yet to uh, put that down. I don't know. What do you guys think? Should I? I feel like it's got to have some kind of color. Let's see. So it would be like that. I feel like that's just, it's too close to the rest of, yeah, the, the poster that I'm, that I'm painting from, it's like everything is so blue, and, you know, I know that's the, the feeling, but I don't know if I'm ready to go that blue. Let me try yellow. That's one of the funny things about the sky. You know, when you're when you're painting sky, you can often use like yellow ochre in it, but if you do it too much, it turns everything green, and that might be what I want now, but I don't know for sure. So I'm just gonna go very lightly. Yeah, uh, originally the. That person that this is for, um, I had asked them if they would want a shot of Cap in the elevator for you know the famous scene, and uh, the the reason I wanted to add usually I, I just kind of do what I want, but on that one, he would have been looking down and you wouldn't really get to see his face, and so uh, you know I wanted to make sure they were okay with that, but they they really they wanted to see his face. Uh, so I picked just kind of a more standard shot. Um, but if I had done the elevator scene, it would have been, the background would have been kind of like a blurry version of DC, you know, because the elevator that he's on has a uh, glass. And you can see everything. Maybe in the future, we'll see. So like I said, this is, just really to make sure that I'm not just fighting the white. And so that, you know, the rim light on his shoulder strap, like all that stuff, kind of pop a little bit more. Let's see, what, uh, what colors do you use initially to mark the values and to do these washes? Uh, so, the blue that I, I typically use is Payne's gray. It, it leads to, you know, almost a navy. And the uh, the warm version I, I use is sepia. That's what I was using up here. And I'll get back to that in a second. Uh, but those are my two main ones. And the only reason that I wouldn't use that is for, for instance, like on the ear, when I know that I'm going to want a saturated color, I won't put a, a desaturated one. That's enough. I haven't decided if I'm, I'm going to like that yet, but uh, either way, no matter what, at the top, I'm probably going to have like a darkish blue that fades, you know, gets lighter towards the bottom. All right, now. I'm going to start putting in some more planes of the face. You know, these are... Um, uh, these shadows right here. Because the way the light is working, you know, you've got kind of a fill light 
you know, the main light is coming in at this angle. And so you're getting a highlight here, here, and kind of the top. Of the you know, it's mostly from the right, uh, you know, his left. It's mostly from the top. But it's not, you know, creating any cast shadows. It's, it's down far enough where, you know, you're still seeing most of his face. And there's the main rim light on the side. Uh, and then, of course, you know, then there's even a rim light on the other side as well, but it's so far behind him that it's really just almost a white outline, uh, which is, you know, it's one reason that a lot of movie posters look the same because they all have this lighting, which it, it works. It's, it's really great finding the face, but if you want to get, you know, if you want to make something that looks a little bit different, um, I've, I've found a little bit more luck with actually, you know, going through the movie and trying to get a still, you know, freeze frame it to get something a little bit more unique. Because most of the studio photography is going to look exactly like this. All right, so I'm using a Renaissance number 10. This is a cat's tongue, but it's so old and used that it looks mostly like a filbert. It's kind of like a, well, it's, it's like a filbert. It's like a flat that's rounded at the edges so that, uh, you know, it's not quite so broken um, at the edges, you know, from one paint stroke to the next. You know, and faces like I proceed with the utmost caution. Like, this is not nearly as dark as it needs to be, but what I'm doing is finding the form so that, you know, the underpainting is rock solid. And then I'm not questioning myself when I get to the point uh, towards the end. You know, because that, that often happens if, if you're, if you really just like dive in there. Uh, and you stare at a face for too long, you'll really start to question yourself, like the proportions and, and just, you know, draftsmanship issues. Uh, and that's just not something you want to mess with, you know, at a later stage in, in the game. But on the hair, I can afford to be a little bolder. Hair is often tricky because it's it's sort of a defined line, you know, where where your hair starts and stops. Um, but at the same time, it's it's not a, a set edge. So when you're drawing and painting, you you know you have to make this decision of like, well, how. Like how, how different do I make the, the hair from the, the skin that's next to it? How far do I blend it? And how does the color shift? You know, usually when you have hair, it goes dark, and then there's this little, like, transitional area right here where things get, get kind of... They can get gray, they can get more red. It, it just kind of... It's a weird mix of things, you know, because the, the scalp is actually lighter because uh, it doesn't get as much sun and, uh, but then the hair is and so it's just kind of a you know, there are ways you can achieve it just using color without going in and drawing every hair which is usually not the way I like to do it you know, I'd rather work with just kind of big strokes of color And this part is just pretty much just a 
blown out white. Sip. All right, so we're 35 minutes into this. Um, you know, faces just they just take a long time. So what I'm going to do next? I'm trying to find the eyes, the eyebrows, the nose, and the mouth. You know, the main features in a pretty dark. Mouth. All my darkest darks. And then once those are in there, then I'll start thinking about uh, the overall color. So, you know, the main color of the face, this area right here. And once I figure out what that is, I'll fill in the whole area and leave this white highlight. And uh, once that's there, it'll really start to kind of come together. There's still, there will still be a whole lot of work to do, but you really be able to kind of see where I'm going. Although, of course, you can see that right here on the side, too. Spoiler alert. Uh, switch to my golden natural. So natural hair synthetic blend. I tend to like them because you just get the best of both worlds. Now, I will probably lighten the eyes more than they appear in the photo, just because uh, it'll just be fun to look at. No other reason. I told you we'd be staring at Chris Evans' eyes for the evening. So don't say I didn't warn you. Yeah, blonde hair is always tricky because as you can see in his eyebrow, they, I mean, it gets almost to pure black in some areas and just, it really just depends on how the light's hitting it and Good reference, paint from life if you can, and pay attention. Yeah, when I was doing that one piece, the first one that was done back, um, I I, the only reference I had was stuff that I had found online. You know, the movie hadn't been released. It wouldn't be released until the following year. And so there were only like crappy set, you know, leaked set photos. Painted that first costume. It was so wrong. And I, I painted it. I gave him like this, uh, it was just weird. It's like this mask. Because uh, I thought like that he was going to have like some kind of like leather goggles or something because of the one piece of reference that I had. I just it was so blurry and so far I just couldn't tell. But I had to do something, and uh, so I just painted the best I could, and uh, still ended up getting the job. <laughs> but uh, when Marvel ended up using it as a as a cover for a comic. They did have me change it, so I had to repaint it. I think I, I can't remember if I painted on the original or not. I must have.
Uh, you'll see me do that sometimes. You know, if I ever put down too much paint, I'll just take my finger and go, take it right back off. That's life. Yeah, and see, this is actually why I, I don't always like the studio photography. Uh, you know, you'll get weird lines and weird shadows, like on the nose. I don't know if you guys can see it on here. It might be too dark. But, like, the nostril is creating this, like, really distinctive straight line down to the tip of the nose. Part of it is just the way, you know, everything is. But part of it is just the weird you know, trick of the lighting. So... If it were under normal circumstances, you would never see that kind of shadow. Uh, but because there are, you know, lights bouncing every which way, you know, the intersection where no lights are hitting, it ends up being a very weird shape. And so sometimes you can work with it, sometimes you, you can just ignore it. Um, in this case, it's weird because it, the reason they do the studio photography like that is because it really defines the face. It almost makes the face look like a drawing. Uh, so you get like almost an outline on his nostril, an outline where the, um, you know, underneath. Uh, it's just, it's weird. And then you're getting like a cast shadow underneath the tip of the nose. That's one reason it's just so difficult to... You know, work from multiple references at the same time. You know, because there's just, there's weird things that are happening and they look correct. Like, you know they're right because they actually happened in real life. Uh, but you, you couldn't, you couldn't necessarily explain it. Whereas uh, a freeze frame from the movie, you know, it's often much easier to determine, like, oh, there's a lamp on their left side. And just, you know, a little bit of moonlight coming in from the window like it's just a little bit even though it is still staged it's not quite to this level and so it usually looks a little bit more authentic if that makes sense Just, I just remember there's a brush I wanted to use that I never got to. Darn it. Oh, here it is. I got it. This is a uh, Rosemary and Company. It's a UK company that they make really nice brushes, or at least I heard that they made really nice brushes. I bought one, it got lost in the mail, and uh, because I, I was like in the process of moving, I think that's what happened. And, and I, I bought another one, and so I never really got to use it. I, got, I opened it up once and I tried it, but uh, you can see that, that nice point. You know, it's, it's similar to a Windsor Newton number seven, uh, you know, one of the big ones, like the number six, uh, which is, honestly, it'd be my preferred brush, but they're just too expensive uh, for what they are, like, for and for how long that they don't last. <laughs> um, you know, I used to use them for inking, which they're not really supposed to. They're, they're specifically made for watercolor, but even if you're just using it for watercolor, uh, they just they never seem to last or hold you know, that point that you really want. 
So I'm giving myself a treat by working with a new brush. This is like my ideal brush because it's it's pretty big. You can make a big bold stroke if you want, uh, but at the same time, you know that the point that it comes to is razor thin. And you know you usually want that for watercolor. Um, Eyebrows are so funny. Huh? They like if you if you draw the individual hairs, they look wrong. But if you just draw it as a line, it looks wrong. So you always have to kind of walk this fine line. It's like it's a color and it's a mass, but it's made up of individual parts, and it's very distinctive. You know, it looks like a caterpillar on your face. At least in my case. Uh, but at the same time, you know, it's blending. It's not a hard transition. And actually, you know, same thing often with the eyes. You know, that lower lid. You know, there are times I'm, I'm looking at this and I, you can't really say, like, exactly where it ends. And so, you know, weirdly, if you try and pick out where it ends, it won't look right. So you want a little bit of ambiguity or it won't look right. You know, if you're going for a somewhat realistic style, that is. You know, basically, you preface everything I say with that little caveat. Yeah, so, I mean, when you look at the shadows on that nose, it's just, they're all over the place. Like, it, it looks real, but, man, I, you know, the lights just come from every, every which direction. And occasionally, I'll, you know, in some of the reference that they gave me from the photo shoots, you can see, like, <laughs> you can see the people who are, like, running the show. And they've got, you know, some weird light at a weird angle. You know, it's some production assistant who's down on the ground holding a mirror. Uh, or in one case, there's one with a, you know, I think it was with a Loki. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why, but the, the, the production assistant is, is like in with him. And, you know, obviously meant to be photoshopped out. But he was just there like holding some aspect of the costume uh, just to make it you know look right uh, but you know in a way that would never actually work in reality so you know, that's that's how the sausage gets made tired of doing this. This is pretty much what always happens to me. I like, I, I say I'm going to do like a fully rendered underpainting. It's perfect. And then like an hour into it, I'm just like, come on. Let's add some color. Add some detail. Make it look alive. But 
that being said, there are certain details I need to get locked down. I need to know where the line of the mouth is. I mean, I know it's got to be pretty dark. All right, good enough. Let's throw some color on there. And take a sip of some bourbon. I'll see if there are any questions that I missed. I need to add it to your list. Yeah, I'm sorry about the list, guys. I really, I did take, like, a home commission list that goes back to, God, I think 2008, nine. You know, the main one that was holding up the line was uh, Sinister 16, which I finally finished. I did one after that, and then I think the next one in the line. It's been so long, like, I don't even, I need to find the email where I had it all listed. Um... Hola, hello, B Otto. Um, talking about my muted colors. Yeah, I mean, I do like bold color, but for something like this, um, you know, I keep things pretty tame because that, that's kind of like the movies, what it's about. He's like in stealth mode. Um, Does his suit in the reference look as dark in person as it does in camera? Yeah, it's pretty dark. I mean, it's a full-on, it's a full-on navy. Um, yeah, I mean, I remember seeing some of the studio photography, and you know, it it'll look more cyan if they put a really bright light on it. But if you saw it in person, it you know, it looks like navy from the flag. All right, so now what I'm going to do is fill in, you know, this main area where I still don't know exactly what it's going to be. Maybe what I should do is just do a really light wash of burnt sienna. Just to block things out. Give me something to work against. Yeah, because a lot of with painting, like, I don't even know what I'm doing until I get some paint on the canvas. Yeah, that's obviously wrong. Do I keep things wet? Really, this is almost, you know, the main purpose of this is just to define that white highlight on the left side of his face. Just so I know what kind of world I'm working in here. And once I can kind of envision it a little bit better, I'll go a little bit bolder, a little bit more burnt sienna. That's not too bad. At this point, actually, I want to go more saturated than I'll end up with because at the early stages, it's easier to go saturated. Um, whereas at the end, as things get more and more opaque, as I was saying earlier, it gets tougher and tougher to achieve the same level of saturation without you know, using a lot of saturated pigment. You know, I'm still, I'm just, I'm trying to develop a framework so that I know exactly where everything goes 
And then once I know that, then I can do those big kind of brushy, bold strokes. And those don't come, you know, those are like literally the last strokes that I make. Uh, partially because I'm, I'm just so terrified uh, that I'm going to mess it up. Um, so in reality, I should be doing that stuff at the beginning. So I'll know whether or not I'm going to Yeah, at this point, it always kind of looks to me like a tinted photograph. You know, like the underdrawing, the underpainting is there, but the colors just look weird because all you're doing is kind of. In. But it's just, it's, it's such large areas of color. It looks kind of fake. You know, because the subtleties of, of the face, it's just. It's kind of crazy, like, you know, for one, how subtle it is, and, and two, how people can read the subtlety. They won't be able to explain what's wrong, but they'll just know something's off. And uh, it's just because we're just so good at reading faces. You know, like, people, not, and I'm not just talking about, like, expression, I'm talking about just color. You know, like, you can tell if somebody's sick. You know, and so if if the color is off, like you know, humans are pretty good at at telling. So right now, this is just pure, I won't say pure, it's uh, burnt sienna mixed with a little bit of white to, to tone it down a little bit, but I, I, I need to throw some other colors in there. It's just getting too orangey. Uh, so I'll take a little bit of gray. That's actually why I keep gray on the palette, because it's just great for taking the edge off of some of these colors. Yeah, and I, I don't know if you've ever heard about this, but they, they have like the zones of the face. So, you know, the middle zone is supposed to be more red. So you've got your nose and your cheeks. And that's true of most people. And then on men, uh, it gets a little more blue uh, because of, you know, facial hair. And then the top is a little bit more yellow, like the forehead. It's not that part, I don't know, is, you know, it's just different for everybody, obviously. But, um, you know, it, 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 there is a subtle difference there. So it's, it's good to pay attention. You know, every face is different, but that's one of the commonalities that's seen a lot, you know, especially for men with facial hair. You know, my own face included. It gets pretty gray. Even before I was, even before I had a gray beard, uh, you know, those hair follicles just really uh, affect the color of the skin. You know, and that's useful. Like I love, I love using that as a, as a cartooning trope. You know, uh, I loved doing that on <laughs> the Punisher. <laughs> Made him look like uh, a Popeye villain. So that's actually the interesting thing about gray. So if you use the gray tones, 
That's too dark. Uh, so you can use, you know, like I said, Holbein's got three versions of gray, but if you apply them uh, transparently, they will be much, much warmer. Uh, that's called, you know, their undertone. Uh, then when you apply them opaquely and let them dry, and they're going to be much, much cooler. They're going to be a true gray. Uh, but what I like about them is I like using them transparently because it yields a, just an absolutely beautifully warm gray that's perfect for a lot of things. Uh, but part of the reason it's like that is because when uh, you have to add white to it, so that cools it down, and so they have to counteract that with some warmer tones, like orange. I don't know exactly what they use. I'm sure it lists it on the tube. But, you know, because of that, when you're using it transparently, it's, it's pretty distinctive how much warmer it is than you might think. So this, now I'm, I'm just gonna use pure gray number two. It's chinny chin chin. stash should be you know what I what I haven't gotten to paint yet is uh, bearded cap I thought I was going to so one of one of my um, sketches for Avengers Infinity War it was going to be a redo of the classic George Perez cover uh, with the infinity gauntlet and then I, what I had was the um, uh, the lens flares from each gem were, you know, they're acting as um, kind of a framing device. And within each of those frames, you know, I, I had a part where I could do a montage of the characters. And then as the, as the light passed through them, you'd get one side that was the, um, you know, without a mask and then one side with the mask. Because because these are for the cast and crew, you know, you want to you wanna show the, the actor if you can. Um, but in, in the case of what ended up being the end game one, you know, we split it mainly into, you know, heroes and villains just to make things a little bit easier. Uh, I just, I need a break because we're, we're talking about like over 30 characters and to do that many portraits, like it just such a time sink. I think it took me for almost 400 hours for end game and it took me 200, um, for Infinity War. Um, had to do a lot of edits on Infinity War. <laughs> so when you take a job, there, there, there are a few clients I'll, I'll do this for. One of them is, is Marvel Studios, but you want to get stuff locked down. You, you want to establish the rules of the, of the job at the beginning. And this, this goes, you know, it's just good life advice in but uh, they wanted me to start working on Infinity War before I had a sketch for Endgame. And so I did the whole Infinity War uh, sketch. I figured out whatever it was going to be. I got you know, basically approved. And uh, later on, we started working on Endgame. And that's when they decided to flip Infinity War because they really wanted to accentuate the villains versus the, the heroes. And so that meant I had to actually, you know, flip all of the villains so they were facing the other way, which, you know, wasn't too hard, but uh, all of the, the villains from the uh, Children of Thanos, they're all asymmetrical. So like, I had to move Proxima Midnight's face, Call of City, I had to go the other way, I think. Yeah, and uh, what's his face? I had to switch him to. He was based on a sculpture that I had found, so I had to reverse. Anyway, it was a lot of extra work, and I like I knew something like that was going to happen at the beginning, just because we didn't have the, the end game thing locked down. But you know, we got through it. We figured it out.
in general, you want to try and avoid that if at all possible. All right, so this lip is now really bothering me. So I got to get a little bit more shadow in there. And I got to get some red in there. Oh, I screwed that up. A little bit of water. Bring that chin back. Maybe strengthen the shadow under the nose a bit. It's too much sepia. Yeah, this is this is the part where, you know, these are the the what I always think of as the Drew Struzan highlights. You know, like I said, it it comes from studio photography, but because we all grew up on Drew Struzan, like, you know, this is the part where he puts white, pure white acrylic paint on the painting and it looks amazing. Um, so it's hard not to, it's just hard not to think that way because that style is just so ingrained in, you know, I was born in 81. So like, to me, that's what a movie poster looks like. It's just, you know, somewhere in my brain, there's just this idea of what a movie poster looks like. And it's basically, you know, was created by Drew Struzan. Now, obviously you can do other things, but I'm just saying like, because of when I was born and, and when I grew up, it's just, it's just a part of me. And I know I'm not alone there. Mm. Well, let's throw some blue in those eyes. Bothering me. So this is uh, Payne's gray and a little bit of white. I'm gonna make them bluer than they should be, uh, just to really make them pop. And I need to come back. You know, here this highlight is where I, you know, I'm letting the paper show through. Here I accidentally covered it up, so I got to go back in and. Probably do it on this side too, but in general, I like to leave it there until the very end when I'm going to do my opaque passes. I'm still in this. Now, this is still kind of the very beginning of the portrait. You know, I know we're an hour into this, but it's just they just take a long, long time. What we can do. I keep, I keep avoiding the lips. That actually is a problem of mine. I, I usually, I start with the eyes and then I, the nose, and then I just kind of give up around the lips. And this is, goes for everybody, not just him. I don't know why. But I'm gonna keep avoiding it. And I'm gonna mix up some yellow ochre and just uh, put a little bit of an indication of that blonde hair. Now, blonde hair, like I was saying, it's tricky because you know you need some yellow ochre, but you also need to keep it very muted. You know, and a little bit of burnt umber, burnt sienna, it just kind of depends. You know, blonde can be a lot of different things. And then I should probably fill in this because that 
that rim lighting is actually not as strong as I've left it there. It's actually pretty dark. And this is, you know, this is kind of like a non-color. You know, it's it's going to be some kind of warm gray. I don't know what it is. I'm just going to slap something on there until it looks halfway right. No, I couldn't tell you what, what color that is. Nor do I care. You know, there is just that edge of white right there. And then it gets a little bit brighter at the, the temple. And then there's actually a cast shadow right here. Those ones are real tough to do. Um, you're just basically beholden to the reference at that point. Because it's, it's kind of tough to make it up. I'm just too scared to do this. Oh hell, why not? Let's let's figure out what this color is, right? Right there, the, the shadow. You know it's gonna be warm, but you know it's gonna be gray. That's too warm. So I'll bring my gray back in. And that's all, you know, that's basically all it is. You just move it around the palette, pushing things warmer, cooler, redder, you know, wherever you need to go. It's, you know, very rare that when it comes to color that the first stroke is, is on. And that's one reason I like using the uh, Stay Wet palette, because once I do figure out what the hell color I need, I don't want to have to mix it again. And so, you know, that's why I like to stay wet. Yeah, so that's basically just gray. I, th I think I will have to warm that up at some point. It'll be okay, you know, where his beard would be. But up towards his cheek, it's going to have to get a lot redder. I guess I can show you what that means. I'll just add some burnt sienna. You know, really, you could do a whole portrait with just burnt sienna, white, and gray, uh, you know, and have it look you know, somewhat decent. I mean, obviously, it'd be nice to have other colors in there, but I'm just saying that there's a lot you can do with not much. Yeah, I remember talking to one old school artist. Uh, uh, and I just I happened to meet because he me because he he had a studio above a friend of my, me and my dad's, and uh, his one one of his teaching tricks was you know he'd let the students pick uh, any three colors, did not matter, and he would you know create a quote unquote realistic portrait using only those colors. Uh, just, just to prove that, you know, it's just colors all. You know, the, the physical you know, wavelengths that are hitting your eyes are, you know, it's just, it has nothing to do with what you're seeing. You know, everything's done in, in context. And actually, if, if you're looking to, I guess I could do some recommendations. If you want to learn more about that stuff, the really technical, a book by Bo Lotto, L-O-T-T-O. Um, it's kind of a, it's a weird book. Uh, I was all over it. Like I love that kind of stuff. Um, it's kind of meandering, but uh, if you want to get the essence of what he's talking, about, I posted his his lecture one time. Um, so just look look up Bo Lotto on YouTube, and you'll see where he kind of shows how context is, is everything. But he wrote a book about that. 
and it talks about a lot of different things. You know, it's all, I don't know if psychology is the right word or if it's neurology, but, you know, just the way that how perception is, is so much different than the reality of, of what we're seeing. And, you know, and how that's not a, a good thing or a bad thing. It's just how our brains work. You know, it's really weird. It's not, it's completely counterintuitive. I am not liking that color. I just want to darken this whole area. That's too... Don't drink and paint, folks. <laughs> no, the real the real problem is me talking. I guess it's a highlight. I need to leave it, let it dry, and then come back to it. Because if I keep touching it, it's going to be worse. All right, let's do those lips. Because that'll solve everything. I think, I think my lips scare me is because they They're, they're, again, the colors are just so subtle. You know, and the, the difference between someone looking normal and someone looking like they're wearing lipstick. It's, it's just not that much difference. So, in general, you know, the top lip, you know, is going to be mostly in shadow, so it's going to be very muted. Uh, so you almost won't have any, like, lizard and crimson in it at all uh, but at the same time sometimes it catches some reflected light and so it'll be a little bit pink not too much and then of course there are differences among people so chris evans has some pretty red lips um not everybody does some people have no lips basically You know, when I, when, when I draw Batman, like, it's just, it's just a line. It's just a grim line. Um, when I draw Matt Murdock, I give him pretty luscious lips. So uh, we got a little bit of a lizard, some burnt umber, some white. You know, I'm trying to find that. That's probably too orange. And that's too much uh, sienna. I use. I think that's a little bit better. I need to go darker. This is probably not exciting to hear me talk about it. You probably should see me mixing it, but I don't want to mess with that right now. So the highlight is usually in the middle of the bottom lip, and then people usually have like a cleft 
kind of towards the middle, myself included. And so there's just always uh, interesting shapes that are, I find them very difficult to get a lock on. You know, like usually I don't have too much of a problem, you know, uh, from a draftsmanship point of view. Um, you know, pretty good, you know, fairly accurate. But when you get into lips and anything that has a lot of tiny shapes within it, and uh, a lot of transitions that aren't that stark, or you know, some are stark, some are not, uh, it just makes things a little trickier. You know, because some parts of the lip, it's very distinctive. But you've got uh, a plane change on top of a color change. You know, that happens at the, the filtrum when it connects to the top lip. You know, it's a very uh, distinct change, but it's not just color and it's not just the, the angle. It's both. Um, but at the same time, there's a little bit, it's a little bit rounded. It's not perfectly straight. You know, and then everybody's face is different. Everybody's lips are different. And so this section is always weird for me because the um, the curve the curves go in different directions. Uh, it's tough to explain without like you hold a sculpture in your hand. Uh, but man, you know, it's mathematically speaking, there's some really complex compound curves going on, and then you couple that with uh, you know the changes in in actual, you know, skin color, uh, and it's, it gets pretty complex. So the only way to get better is just to, you know, have good subject matter, have good reference. <laughs> 